Welcome back to Design Emergency, the podcast and platform that Alice Rostorn and I, Paola Antonelli, have founded to discuss the crucial role of design in all efforts, big and small, individual and collective, local and planetary and beyond, to achieve a better future for all. Our guest today is Hiro Ozaki. Welcome, Hiro. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Hero is a designer, multimedia artist, educator, and entrepreneur, better known as Sputnikel. And Sputnikel creates possible future scenarios and future artifacts as an artist and multimedia artist inspired by emerging or existing technologies. She wants to promote with these artifacts discourse on topics such as gender, reproduction and interspecies relations and more. And she often works with scientists to develop working prototypes of these future artifacts. And then moreover, to convey a possible future scenario, she also creates iconic music videos that have explanatory and narrative lyrics and then pop music and even films which often stars herself and he in her latest reincarnation she's also an entrepreneur so we have a lot to talk about here but first of all where does the name Sputnikov come from? Sputnikov is quite an unusual name but it's actually my high school nickname and it comes from the Russian satellite Sputnik So the reason why um, my friends called me Sputnik is that I, I'm half British and half Japanese, but my friends in Japan said, and sorry, this is going to be a bit politically incorrect, but since I love science and I'm so tall, they're like, you're not half British, you're actually half Russian. <laughs> like that, that's what my friends said. So, and, and Sputnik was the only Russian word my friend knew, and she started calling me Sputnik. And you know how Japanese girls' names have ko at the end of the names, like Yoko, Aiko. So Sputnik became a Sputniko, and then the name kind of just stuck. I, I used the name to make music and perform, and I made videos under my name, and... Now I, I'm Sputniko, and I think most people in Japan know me by Sputniko, so that if I introduce myself in my real name, Hiro, people will be like, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, I like that there's also an exclamation mark at the end. It's not even just Sputniko, it's yeah, an yeah. exclamation mark. No, it's it's very distinctive. Yeah, it's, ex <laughs> it's that mark, yes. Yeah, but it's a high school nickname. Yeah, that's the answer. You are British Japanese, and I know you went to high school in Japan, but then you came to the United Kingdom, right? So when I met you, your art practice was set in a very unique way because you were between London and Tokyo and between design, multimedia, and music. So how did that whole kind of fluidity work in how you presented your work? Yeah, I have a background in mathematics and computer science. That's what I studied in university. Since I was very young, I really loved science, programming. So it was very natural for me to study that at school. But at university, I started, started to feel like I was, yes, very interested in technology, but I became more interested in the kind of future that the technology could lead us. I was becoming more interested in imagining about the f these futures. And then I started making music about technology, future. I started making music videos. And uh, then Royal College of Art, which is right next door to Imperial College. Yeah, you were going to Imperial College for math and computer <laughs> sciences, right? And so you just went up the street. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I was very hardcore. <laughs> yeah, it's like right next door. <laughs> and uh, RCA, at RCA, there was this fantastic course, Design Interactions, Uh, masters, which was taught by Anthony Dunn and Fiona Raby, uh, who were who have a gigantic impact on my life and my uh, thinking. No, not only yours, on design history. Yeah, exactly. And they were really working on speculative design, designing to to stimulate discussions about implications of technologies in the future. And when I saw their work, I thought, wow, this is really close to the kind of direction I would like to explore. So that's why I decided to go right next door to RCA to 
work with Fiona and Tony and really changed my life. Yeah. And that's when I met you because as a curator, it was always my point to go every June to see the end of your show at the RCA. So I saw your thesis project and I was completely won over. That's where my love story with Hero and Spotnikov became and uh, several pieces came to MoMA for exhibitions. And, you know, there are so, so many projects that I would like the whole world to know. But so let's start, for instance, with menstruation machine, Takashi's take. Mm -hmm. And if you could take us through the whole project, all its different pieces so that people can yeah. understand what I'm talking about. Menstruation machine is a machine that allows people who don't menstruate to experience the whole process of menstruation. So it has electrodes on the abdomen that simulates the pain and also a tank at the back, which stores about 80 milliliters of blood, which flows between your legs. I made the machine and also a music video about a character who uses the machine. And then I posted the video on YouTube. Menstruation is very, very complicated process. It, it involves so many things like nausea, mood swings, hormonal changes. But I, I thought, why not? you know, create, design a machine that allows someone to experience at least the pain and bleeding. <laughs> and the reason why I designed this machine was that because I felt there was not enough discussion about menstruation in society, especially in 2010 when I made this work. It was even more of a taboo then. than like now there's talk about menstruation in the media, like quite a lot of discussion, but back then it was very much a taboo. But I, I felt it was so strange because half the population of this planet experienced menstruation, but the whole society acts like it doesn't even exist and we shouldn't be talking about it. So I made the menstruation machine as a Kickstarter of conversations. And I thought that if more people could understand the experience of menstruation, the pains and some of the troubles, then the world might become a better place. It would help conversation for sure. And, you know, we installed together this piece, you know, Menstruation Machine in 2011 the, in the exhibition Talk to Me at MoMA. And I remember it was quite a sensation, not only because of the topic, but also because there's such beauty in the objects that you make. The fact that they're a working prototype, they're gorgeous. Then you always inhabit the character with still images. And then there's the pop song. And I remember... One more step, that pop song presented Takashi, whose gender was kind of ambiguous, right? Yeah, yes. And it was you in the, in the movie, but yeah. And, and, and Takashi was going around Tokyo with his girlfriend, you know, like his friend that was a girl. And she's the one singing and telling, her, and telling them, oh, it hurts, right? And it's going to hurt even more. So uh, can you tell us about the pop music part? I have a background in music as well, so... I created this whole music video surrounding this narrative of menstruation machine and the character Takashi, who I'm performing, who's quite ambigu gender ambiguous, like you mentioned. The reason why I was experimenting with this pop media was that in 2010, at the time, I really wanted to experiment with the blossoming social media pop culture because back then, 2008 to 2010, it was really democratizing, transforming the youth culture. Like these days it's so normal for young people to post things online, make a social movement online, become an influencer overnight. But then it, like in 2010, it was still very something new, something to work with. And I, I thought it's an interesting vehicle for me to put my work out, put my narratives work uh, out to discuss pressing social issues, especially gender and feminism. It's really beautiful because it really reaches many people. And by the way, um, you will be able to see the objects that we're talking about on the Instagram platform at design.emergency and also on Spotniko's website. They're really worth it. And uh, the music video were done for many other projects that we will not have time to mention today. But so going back to menstruation, fast forward to today, mm -hmm. you recently reprised the menstruation machine in menstrual verse where you offered it as a wearable in Decentraland, so NFTs for charity. So it was a 3D virtual world, browser-based platform, digital artifacts available as an NFT. And it's very funny because I understand that you encountered still 
quite some prejudice, right? So do you want to talk about that project? Yes. So in 2022, I created this work, Menstruverse, which is a collection of wearables that allow avatars to menstruate in the metaverse, because I thought, well, why, why not? You know, why, why not try menstruating in the metaverse and you know, see what it means to be menstruating in the digital space? And it began as quite a lighthearted experiment. Uh, and I made the menstruation machine in 3D and also a set of period stained jeans and pants for avatars to wear in the space. But when I tried to put the wearables in the Decentraland marketplace, they were like, no, absolutely no menstruation in the metaverse. <laughs> These wearables are not allowed, which was like a big surprise because it's two 2022, it's not 2010, you know? Yeah. And uh, but then you could do it. Yeah, you uh, could do it if you painted it blue, like in the, uh, yeah. stupid ad, in the stupid commercials from a few years ago where you couldn't show blood that was red. You had to make it blue. Yes, that's what happened. So there, there was this really quirky, very interesting debate that happened between the Decentraland team and myself. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, we were talking whether this could be approved. And I was like, oh, can it be blued like the old adverts with the you know, blue blood? And they're like, yeah, that, that's a great option. Make the blue blood. And I was like, it's no. so funny. You know, these prejudices still abound and we're going to get there. But uh, prejudices are also, well, they always are a big part of your work. They have been a focus. Like I, I would like to talk now about the Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women. If you could please talk about that project. Yes. So this is a project that I created in 2018 with artist Tomomi Nishizawa. And it was a reaction to a huge scandal in Japan, which found that many, many medical schools were deducting points of female applicants exam scores deliberately so that fewer women entered the medical schools. And this is crazy, but it was going on years and years until 2018 like that's only five and a half years ago they found out i was very furious about what happened so in response we created a fictional university tokyo medical university for rejected women which was for women who were rejected from these very prejudiced japanese medical schools and when the scandal broke out the medical schools, they were saying like, oh, even if we educate women, oh, they get married and have children and quit. So what's the point in educating? That, that's exactly like the, the excuse that they had for not allowing women to enter this school, which just shows how bad gender equality is in Japan. And they, they changed now. They, they stopped um, doing this prejudice. And now more women enter medical schools in Japan than men right now. But um, this was what was happening. But you didn't do a pop song for this one, you know? You didn't do a pop song for this one. No, no, no. For, for this one, it wasn't a pop song. We, we made a fictional school where we gather, gather these women. And it's, it's a very tongue-in-cheek, black humor, sarcastic school. But we, we gather the women. And since Japan loves the male doctor so much. We build the perfect male doctor robot and we put them onto drones and deliver them across Japan so that these women can contribute to the future of Japanese medicine without putting their talent to waste. And we made a cheesy university brochure video and we made an open campus exhibition in Tokyo, which was very, very popular. And uh, yeah, that, that was a project we did yeah, in 2018. Yeah, it's, it never ends. But you you went, when it comes to this idea of uh, gender equality and also women's health, besides women being doctors, you made this fabulous step. It's fabulous for Alice and myself because it proves that you can go from design, even speculative design, to hardcore reality. And you became an entrepreneur. You know, you founded a whole company uh, and you now run it also as a CEO, and it's successful, and it's called Cradle. Could you please tell us how it happened and what Cradle does? Yes, since I created the menstruation machine in 2010, I've always felt strongly about you know, women's rights, women's support, more support for women's health, which really led me to becoming uh, a founder and CEO of Cradle. And Cradle, basically, it's 
now uh, probably the largest and fastest growing corporate benefits platform in Japan, with specializing in women's health and also promoting diversity and inc- inclusion in the workplace. And our clients now include uh, co- uh, Sony, Nissan, Honda. Wow, I'm so impressed here. Oh, yeah. What do you, and what do you provide to them? On our platform, we have a range of educational video content, which uh, edu- can educate employees about pills or menopause, menstruation. And we have a network of over 120 clinics, gynecologists, clinics, uh, where uh, they can provide discount to employees for fertility treatments, egg freezing, or checkups uh, on menopause and gynecology checkups. And we're now covering over half a million employees. And we're expanding so much that we began our IPO process. So we're aiming to IPO uh, early 2027 on the Tokyo Stock Exchange, which is really exciting. Like, for, My God, yes, congratulations. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, but it's very very um, exciting journey for me for being a d- designer to entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah, but you used your celebrity status because, you know, we're talking to Hiro here, but in, in Japan, she's really well known. You were on the cover of Vogue and, you know, people really know about you. So it was a way to break through, mm-hmm. uh, right? Y- yes. And uh, also, uh, there there's a lot of things I like to mention about my journey for, to be an entrepreneur. So because as a designer, I've always been... Through my work, I was always interested in talking about the future, asking questions about the future. But then there came a point when I started to think, well, I'm always talking about the future and why don't I start trying building one? You know, and I I think actually in the last 10 years, it's become increasingly more accessible for the younger generation to raise funds, to build a project or start their own company. Uh, It's become a lot easier, I think, now than maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago. 10 years ago, I was often talking about designing for debate, but then the quality of debate that's happening on the internet really quickly deteriorated recently with so many extreme opinions and fake information. So I felt like I really need to invent the next step forward for myself in in this time and age. And fortunately, when I was in Tokyo, I had many friends who were running startups. And I was really inspired by how they would build an idea for the future and then raise funds from the big idea, gather a team and actually build it and make it happen. And it was really exciting to see some of these products and services coming into fruition. I always hated capitalism. As a student, I didn't want to have anything to do with it, but I felt like maybe if I understand capitalism and use it as a tool to my advantage, maybe I could use it to build a better future, uh, which I believe in. And that's how I really stepped into entrepreneurship. I feel that by looking at your career, one really looks at a moment in the history of design at a real curve because you went through, well, let's forget for a moment the math beginnings, but let's go into speculative design. So you went into speculative design in the golden age of speculative design and in the in the best place, which was Tony and Fiona's interactive design interactions program at the RCA. Mm -hmm. Then you moved from there when design, speculative design started becoming too uh, well known in society and therefore uh, considered too speculative and not Mm -hmm. enough design. And you moved to MIT, to the Media Lab, where you were a teacher, and you started having more science in your projects. Then from there, you moved back to Tokyo and you started slowly but surely, as you said, funding a company to build the future. While at the same time, also Tony and Fiona started a program here in New York to do active research in real design. So it's very interesting because we also see the ebbs and flow of the idea of speculation and the ways in which designers can build a future. And in a way, would you consider Cradle also an act of design or is it too far-fetched to say so? Oh, I definitely consider it as uh, an act of design. It feels like just an extension to my work. So uh, it's completely designed for me, this new startup. And I think they could, they could be more designers 
founding companies like this, you know. I, I think, yes. We definitely hope so, yes. Mm -mm. And by the way, if you all want to check it out, it's cradle.care, and there's an English version so you can see what we're talking about. And some of you might be familiar with this kind of company, but it's hard to stress enough how disruptive that is for uh, a country like Japan. And that would be also my country, Italy, for that matter. So, so you want to start build the future. What would be an ideal society like for you? Right, so it, it, it's a difficult question since there's so many pressing issues in the world, but if I had to choose one topic, I really would want to have more diverse voices reflected in all aspects of society, but especially technology and science, because it, it really changes so many things about our society, our lives, uh, but there's not enough diversity in there. That interest is really behind my work, Menstruation Machine or Cradle, Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women. And uh, yeah, I'll, I think I'll keep working on that. Yeah, it, it's necessary because in order to build a future, we have to build platforms where the different voices and the diverse voices that you're talking about feel more comfortable speaking. You know, voices are meant to speak, but they don't have enough space to speak yet. So, you know, I was building a crescendo here mm -hmm. from the menstruation machine to menstrual verse and then the... Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women, but I would like to open also a little bit of a parenthesis because I would like to talk about three other characters that I adore and uh, that really are your alter egos. There are Jenny, Selena, and then you with your Nanohana heels. So I want people to understand what all these characters do. So let's start with Jenny. What's Jenny's story? Sure. So Crowbot Jenny is a piece I created um, in 2011, I think. Uh, so I designed a crow-shaped robot that allows you to communicate with crows in the nature. I worked with a crow scientist who gave me different voice calls like, you know, hello, or I'm hungry, or I'm in danger. Uh, and I, I made this robot. And I, again, I created a music video about this crowbot featuring character Jenny, who is the designer of this robot and who uses its robot. And she is a very shy person who doesn't really enjoy talking with other humans. I can so relate to that. That's why I love it so much. <laughs> yeah, I think every character has a bit of me in there because I'm kind of a geek, shy geek, who's not so good at and talking with other people also <laughs> but then uh, yeah she she designs this machine because she she like, wants to communicate with other non-human species yeah so the music video features her and making the machine and going out in the environment and <laughs> yes uh, it, it was a work exploring interspecies communication yeah and now let's go to selena mm. uh, so selena is it, it, she is a character from another video I created. It's called Moonwalk Machine, Selena's Step. So this is a video who's featuring this uh, pr uh, the main character, Selena, who loves the space. She would love to go to the moon. And she was frustrated that ever since 1969, there were no women who were walking on the moon, the surface of the moon, ever since that gigantic leap for humankind in 1969. So she decides that, well, she's going to build a moon rover with huge uh, superhero high heel footprints on that which the moon rover would leave on the surface of the moon. So if she can't go there right now, she's going to launch this moon rover onto the moon so that, you know, as like a mark to lead to leave a mark that she's going to go there someday up in space. So the whole journey. It's the loveliest video and the catchiest song. It remains in your mind forever. You know, I still can sing it. <laughs> and last but not least, let's talk about Nanohana heels, about your feet strutting in Fukushima. Right. So Nanohana heels... I created after uh, the, the nuclear power plant disaster 
that happened in Fukushima in 2011. So after the disaster, the soils of Fukushima were contaminated with um, these uh, substances which um, really needed to be um, cleaned. And I was doing research with the scientists and I found that rape blossom seeds, uh, and rape blossoms are called nanohana in Japanese. So nanohana seeds, if you plant them into soil and when they grow, they absorb the cesium inside the, the soil to clean the soil from um, the disaster, after the disaster. So I designed high heels, which plant the seeds of nanohana into the soil as you walk on the soil. So I designed the heels and I walked on the soil of Fukushima and I created a video um, around this piece and myself walking in one of the most affected areas in Fukushima. And now, after this parenthesis, I want to go back to the crescendo arc that we had uh, created from menstruation machine to menstrual verse and then to the Tokyo Medical University for Rejected Women until the next chapter. So um, thank you, Hiro, so much for demonstrating that the step up from speculative design to reality, even to a pragmatic reality, even pragmatist and even capitalistic reality is not only direct, but also plausible and ethically defensible. That's the kind of systemic revolution that we need. And uh, thank you all for listening to this episode of Design Emergency, the podcast and platform that celebrates design in all its expressions and its fundamental role in making the future of this and other planets better for all humans, species, and all ecosystems. This is Paola Antonelli, and today we have had a conversation with Hiro Ozaki, aka Spotniko, designer, multimedia artist, educator, entrepreneur, and altogether visionary. And together with my co-founder, Alice Frostnorn, I wish you all the best and look forward to bringing you more wonderful guests who, like our heroine, Hiro Ozaki, are changing the world one design act at a time. And remember, there is always a design emergency.